Hello. No, good. Now we are. Good morning. Good morning to everyone, and thank you. It's um, I, welcome, and I'm glad you're here. I can't see you very well, but I'm really glad you're out there. And we're going to start the Venus session. We have a very good session this morning and the rest of the day, and I think all three days are very full of very substantive talks about Venus disease. And we really want to make it interactive, so there are microphones that will be available for you to ask questions. I'd like to start off with an introduction. There are some housekeeping issues uh, that I will mention just briefly, that the RTs and the nurses do have to sign in each day to get CME credits. So if, don't forget to do that. And then also sign up for the fellows course for the pedal, arterial, and venous anatomy on Saturday if you haven't already done so, and you can stay for that. So I'd like to start with a few introductory slides to thank people and uh, make some, some comments here. And uh, of course, welcome to Chicago. I think it's a great place to come for a meeting in the summer rather than in the winter. And we're all happy to be here. And again, don't miss out on this ultrasound uh, guided Venus cadaver workshop on Saturday. Uh, we worked hard to get the Venus part added. If you, um, it's good anatomy if you haven't done it, and you need, you need to do uh, venograms from the feet. So I'm, I'm personally going to go and, and refresh my memory about the, what it looks like in the anatomy. Now, we welcome a lot of people this year from different countries and around the United States. So this meeting has grown to include people from all over the United States and faculty from far and wide, including Brazil, and, uh, and as far as Arizona, Seattle, Florida. So I thank you, everybody, for coming from far away to Chicago, where there's this very green river next to the beautiful lake. And uh, we can all see Lake Michigan from this hotel. <clears throat> it's beautiful. And Chicago is the hometown of Dr. Bergen. And Dr. Bergen was a friend and mentor for many of us. And he just recently passed away, so I wanted to mention that he lived in Chicago for many years and was chief at vascular surgery at Northwestern. And he just recently <clears throat> passed away, although he retired in 2009. Thank you, faculty, including someone who actually gave up tickets to the World Cup games to come and be with us here today. And um, thank you to all our colleagues who help us in the cases that we show, the anesthetists, the nurses, the ICU, and particularly a non-invasive vascular lab, which is, for me, a very important part of my work. So I want to thank all the ultrasound and duplex people who are here and who help us uh, at our places, and all the patients. I think it takes a lot of courage to have some of the procedures we do, which are relatively new and in evolution, and they don't have any other options. So. I think they're always very courageous to do what we do for them, and we're responsible for the long-term outcomes. I want to thank our industry sponsors, and I want you to go to all the booths you can, every kind of booth you can, and thank them, and just get the information from them, because that means a lot to us for being able to support the meeting next year as well. Thanks to our colleagues at ISIS, including Dr. Walker, who's here today, Tom Best, the, uh, Shirley and Erica from Phoenix, and Dr. Dietrich, who is going to be here with us at the meeting. Thanks to Dr. Matarjami for starting this meeting with, with Jaffer, <laughs> Jaffer Golzar. And Dr. Matarjami used to have a wonderful meeting and symposium in Oak Brook. Uh, many years ago, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, and I was always the last speaker on the last day speaking about venous disease. So now it's grown from that to three days, and, and I think we've come a long way in those years, and that's his daughter, Michelle, who recently got married. And then thank you, of course, to Renee and Joffer Golzar, who are behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, and all the people that work with them for all the hard work they've done all year long to get this meeting together. So I'd like to uh, start us off with a bang. We'll start this Venus session with one of my favorite speakers, Dr. Tom Rook from the Mayo Clinic. And Tom, I welcome you up to the podium to present your first talk. <clears throat>
We have the slides, please. Tom is in charge of uh, vascular medicine and many things I'm sure I don't know about <laughs> at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Welcome. Well, these are things you don't want to know about, Patty. The, um, you're going to get your full of me this morning here. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a surprise total of three talks here. And this is the first one we picked out for you. Chronic venous disease. We're going to talk about differentiating the patient's signs and symptoms. And I have no, no conflicts for this. Well, what do you, you know, Patty is like differentiate, you know, what from what again? Um, there's a couple of possible issues here. You could, I could either be talking about differentiating the signs and symptoms of venous disease from those caused by some other process. For example, a patient walks in, it sounds like a joke, patient walks into a bar with swollen legs, is it caused by their venous disease or by something else? Then there's a second question you can ask when you're talking about differentiating things. You could, you could start with the premise that your patient has venous disease, but maybe they have some other process. And when they walk into your office, they're asking, if we treat the venous disease, is my, are my symptoms going to improve? And if they do, by how much? These are really two separate questions, and one is a lot harder than the other. So let's talk about the easy one first. This is part one. How do you figure out if your patient has venous disease as opposed to something else uh, that might mimic venous disease? Like, for example, lymphedema or perhaps congestive heart failure or any of the other 200 causes of leg swelling and discomfort that we see commonly. Well, no big surprises here. Uh, we can start by taking a history and looking, uh, examining the patient, looking for the typical signs and symptoms. Does your patient have the right kind of skin changes with things like pigmentation? Are there varicose veins? Uh, do they have stasis dermatitis? Uh, edema, obviously. And then it's real easy if they've got some of the more advanced forms of, uh, of chronic venous uh, signs and uh, signs like uh, inflammation and ulcer. They've also got the symptoms. You know, patients will tell you that their veins uh, or their legs hurt, but there's certain words that are better than others. Aching for venous disease, if you ask for a patient to volunteer their symptoms, that's the one that they'll most often volunteer. They'll also give you things like tender, like a bruise or sore, but if they're talking about stabbing pain, shooting pains, uh, these are probably not consistent with venous disease. And then always be suspicious if your patient tells you their skin itches, because that's a good symptom. Now, we can take those symptoms and contrast it with something else. Uh, for example, what do you see when you look at a patient with lymphedema? Well, this looks really kind of different. You know, you get the podorange type skin changes, the hardened uh, skin that uh, will extend all the way out into the toes, give you the swollen boxcar type toes, and you'll get a positive what's called stemmer sign. You can pinch uh, a person's uh, skin at the base of their second toe and get a nice uh, little, little grip of it, but think about trying to pinch an orange. You can't do that. If you can't pinch the skin, that's often a sign of chronic lymphedema. And over time, people with lymphedema will develop verrucous type changes that are sometimes mistaken for tumors, for gosh sakes, don't biopsy one of these because they'll leak lymph fluid forever and it's a huge mess. Now we've also got histories that can help us to sort out whether something's venous disease or, or whether it isn't. It's really great if you're not sure what's going on and the patient comes in and says, oh, by the way, I had a massive DVT in that swollen leg about three years ago. That, that's the kind of history that makes it almost too simple. Usually you've got you've to pull things out a little more uh, delicately than that. One of the most important pieces of history that you can get for figuring out whether something is venous or not is whether or not compression makes the limb feel better. Everybody will tell you, yeah, it's hot, it's tight, I don't like it. But if they say, yeah, that, that aching, that problem I have feels better when I compress it, it's one of the best signs there is because a lot of, uh, most other things don't feel better when you compress them. Now, you can contrast that with the history you'll get when people have other causes for their, their swelling or leg symptoms. Uh, and again, this can sometimes be a little more difficult to, 
dissect out of the interview. They'll tell you that they have a bad thyroid gland, uh, you know, and that they're supposed to be taking replacement or something. Well, this would be myxedema in this case. Maybe they tell you that they've suffered some kind of an injury and they're not able to move or use their limbs properly. That may be the, the whole key to figuring out that they've got some form of dependency or disuse edema. And then the third thing, we've got our history and physical, we've got our exam. The third thing that helps us figure out if something is venous, helps us differentiate it from other problems, is our objective venous testing. Uh, everybody's familiar with ultrasound. We've got one of the world's uh, leading experts in this area, Dr. Gene Zierler is in the, in the back, and he'll be talking at this meeting. But ultrasound gives us the ability to figure out if veins are normal or abnormal. Are they obstructed? Are they incompetent? I myself rely a lot on physiological testing, and I just throw this in to show that we have plethysmographic things that will allow us to um, detect venous obstruction, or we can drain veins and set a patient up quickly and look at for abnormal refilling rates, or with plethysmography, we can actually even test for abnormal calf muscle pumps. So these are things that we can do. And, and then we move more into Patty's realm here, the imaging things, the things that tell us whether the veins look normal. Uh, uh, for example, I, I'm just fascinated by uh, you know, the new advances in 3D CT scanning that uh, can show us all kinds of things about the, the anatomical structure of abnormal veins that I never imagined. And again, contrast this with the fact that for some of these other look-alike things, things that mimic venous disease, we have objective testing for those as well. For example, a lymphocentogram, uh, you can see, um, I was just gonna, you can see here normal uptake through patent lymph vessels on the right leg. This patient is, is imaged as if they're standing looking at you and we've injected radionuclide into the feet here. Uh, over on this side, it can't get up through the block lymphatics, so it diffuses under the skin and gives us what's called a dermal backflow pattern. And you can easily identify objectively lymphedema from non-lymphedema. Well, that's great, Rook. You've answered part one of the questions and you've told us that we can tell venous disease from other things by a history, by a physical exam, and by objective testing. Great. I hope the whole meeting isn't like this. Well, eh, it's not going to be because now we come to part two of our question. A little more dicey. Patient walks into your office and uh, they've got venous disease, but they've got other comorbidities. And what they want to know is, is if we treat the venous disease, how much are the symptoms going to improve? And, and knowing Patty, she's like, okay, Tom, and please be very provocative and controversial about this, whatever you do. So, so here's what I'm going to tell you. This is my provocative, controversial uh, thoughts on this. Uh, venous disease patients, say this person with varicose veins walks in, and they say their leg hurts, but you notice right away that they've also got rheumatoid arthritis or perhaps they have a big baker's cyst that you find on ultrasound, or they've got trauma and an injury that's given them, um, given them problems, uh, or they've got, you can see, calcified arterial vessels there. Maybe they've got arterial disease. Maybe they've got something as simple as painful psoriasis uh, along with their venous disease. The question becomes, if you treat their veins, this is what the patient wants to know, if you treat their veins, either by stripping them, sclerotherapy, ablating, stenting, whatever you do, is the patient going to feel better? And how much better are they going to feel? Well, here's the answer. Why is this guy smiling? The answer can be found on his t-shirt. He's smiling because he has absolutely no idea how to answer this question. Now, I've sort of given you a little bit of an idea already. We can look and uh, try to assess the severity of the venous component of whatever they've got. We can do our history and our physical and our conventional testing. Um, and obviously, the more severe objectively their venous disease is, the more likely you can attribute their symptoms to that. One of the most important things I think you can do is provocative testing by wrapping, and as I mentioned earlier, seeing if that relieves symptoms. To the extent that that helps, that's a, a good way of assessing how much of their problem is venous. But in the end, here's what I tell almost all of my patients who come in. I tell them, 
we're probably going to wind up treating your veins. And I want you to think of the treatment as being a test. And you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, if somebody walked into my office, and I'm an internist, if they walked into my office and they had a long history of severe headaches, I might recommend that we do either a CT or an MR scan. Well, what's that going to cost? You know, I, <laughs> You can go into the literature. I don't know what it costs at your place, $500, $5,000. People are arguing all the time about the cost of these things. But when I do that test for their specific head pain, I'm going to get an answer. I'm going to get something that's either positive or negative. For example, I'm doing it because I'm looking for something like this, a big brain tumor. If I see that, it's a positive test, and I know what to do from there. But even if I do the study and it's completely normal, I say, you know what? We've ruled out a bunch of things. We've ruled out some of the most important things and now we'll focus on something else. And they've spent their money. They've spent their two or three thousand dollars. Well, I tell them that you need to think about venous treatments as being a test in some ways. If you jump on the internet and you look at what various people are charging for things like stripping, or venous ablation, or, uh, or even sclerotherapy if you're looking at multiple sessions, the cost of these things in many cases is not significantly different from the cost of a CT scan or an MR. And I tell people, we're going to do this test. We're going to ablate your veins or sclerosis. We're going to get rid of them and, and see what happens. Now, if we're right, if we're correct that the veins were the things that were primarily causing your problem, then our test is going to be positive. We're going to show that you're feeling better. Uh, and indeed, our test not only will have answered the question, it will have solved the problem in many cases. What if we're wrong? What if it turns out that it's not the veins that's causing the problem, but one of these other comorbidities? Well, then we've at least still answered a key question. We've said, you know what? It wasn't your veins that's causing this problem. We've now taken them out of the picture and we can focus on some of the other things that might have been causing it. And the biggest side effect of having done this is that we've made you look better. Now, when you think about can a diagnostic test in general make you look better, you know, usually not. I mean, it's not many diagnostic tests where you can start looking like that, stick your head in some kind of a scanner, and come out looking beautiful. You know, that's a, that's a pretty unusual test. But in the case of venous disease, Therapy, as not only a, a therapeutic modality, but as a testing modality, is one case where we, we can pull this off. And that's where I'm going to end it. My 12 minutes are up. Thank you. The uh, next speaker is, uh, I'd like to, we're honored to have Dr. Gene Zeeler here. He is the head of the non-invasive vascular lab at the University of Washington, where he inherited the uh, leadership from Dr. Gene Strandness from before. And so it's very much a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you, Patty, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this meeting. Nice to be in Chicago. And so I've been asked to talk about uh, duplex ultrasound for the superficial and deep venous system. And this is one of uh, several talks I'll be giving uh, today and tomorrow, and they're all kind of linked and kind of overlap, but this is kind of the general introduction. And I'm trying to do that. Is it the green button? Oh, there we I don't have anything to dis disclose. So these are some of the applications of venous duplex scanning, and uh, it's, it's a relatively long list. What I'm going to cover in my first uh, 12 minutes is uh, a little bit about lower extremity DVT and chronic venous insufficiency and reflux. So I'm just, I can't see everybody real well, but how many here remember or have performed a, a continuous wave Doppler exam for lower extremity DVT? A few of you, good. I mean, that's where this all started back in the 70s and 80s, and I remember as a fellow in 1978, 79, uh, learning to do this test from Dr. Strandis, and, and when duplex imaging came along, or B-mode imaging came along, we simply added this to what we already knew about uh, venous flow from, from Doppler testing, and combined them to look at both anatomy and physiology and obstruction and reflux, and that's really 
how venous duplex scanning got started. It's now relatively uh, routine to do this with standard duplex systems, uh, a variety of low and high frequency scan heads depending on depth. And for the reflux part of the exam, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, you need a little bit of extra equipment. You need the cuff, the proper cuffs and tubing, and it really helps to have this uh, uh, automatic inflator deflator system that uh, makes it easy to do the um, rapid cuff deflation. The position of the patient is very important when you do a venous uh, ultrasound examination. Uh, for testing for acute DVT, we tend to put the patient with their foot down so their veins are full. And in that position, venous outflow from the lower extremities is determined mo mostly by uh, respiratory activity, the respiratory phasicity that we talk about. Uh, one of the experiments we did a long time ago was to put people in a tilt table and, and look at their venous flow patterns in different positions. And when peop people are feet up, uh, there's much more cardiac effect on the venous flow patterns, it turns out. But we're, we're not used to seeing that because we generally don't examine patients with their feet up. And for proper testing for chronic venous insufficiency, that is reflux testing, it's, it's very important to have the patient standing. And in fact, that's actually uh, part of the, uh, the uh, standard protocols. Uh, how you elicit reflux is another question that we'll talk about later. So the, in the basic interpretation of venous duplex scanning looks at both the Doppler and the imaging components. Uh, obviously, we look to see if the veins are patent, whether flow is spontaneous uh, or it needs to be augmented whether it's phasic with respiration or continuous, uh, whether there's reflux flow, that is flow in the wrong direction, and there, that, that can be elicited by Valsalva in the proximal lower extremity veins, manual compression or standing cuff deflation. And of course, with B-mode imaging, we identify specific vessels. We can, in many cases, see thrombus and perform probe compression. And color flow is kind of an adjunct that we use to demonstrate uh, flow around partially occlusive thrombus, particularly when it can't be well visualized. So the diagnostic criteria really uh, fall into two categories, the image criteria, which we talked about, and the uh, Doppler criteria. So just some examples. Uh, these should look familiar to most of you. Uh, nice phasicity with respiration. The normal uh, abdominal pressure changes are transmitted down the, the deep veins. If the deep veins are obstructed, uh, then that doesn't occur, and we see a more continuous uh, abnormal flow pattern as shown there on the right. Uh, augmentations are left over from the old CW Doppler exam, and when you, you squeeze the, uh, the calf or the foot, uh, you often see a, a spike of augmentation, and uh, this can give you some indirect information about patency, and of course, look at flow direction for reflux. Just some examples of uh, echogenic thrombus uh, and flow around it uh, with the, the color flow, and this helps determine if it's totally occlusive or partially occlusive. Examples of uh, venous compression on the uh, left side, you see a normal uh, uh, common femoral vein and artery, and then uh, compression with the vein completely collapsed and the artery only partially collapsed. And you can tell it's compressed because you now, you can, unlike in the top image, you can, you can see the femoral head there. Uh, on the right side, an example of a thrombus, and, and if, if I see a thrombus like this, I, I almost uh, I may not even bother to perform a compression because it's really not necessary, but uh, you can just uh, make sure that uh, the vein uh, does or does not collapse. Uh, we'll see if these videos run. Looks like they're not going to. Is there any way you can click on that? And there you go. Thank you. So, that, so on the left is a, uh, is a normal common femoral vein compression. You can see the, the vein completely disappearing. And uh, on the right side, the vein is partially compressing suggesting that there's some non-occlusive thrombus there. Then this, this uh, table is from one of our original papers uh, back from the late 80s, uh, looking at the uh, accuracy of the diagnostic criteria for uh, DVT. And uh, in those days, the uh, resolution of the B-mode images wasn't as good as it is now. So the specificity of, of thrombus being visualized was very, very high. But the sensitivity was relatively low, and that's because there's some acute thrombus, which is not very echogenic and can be missed uh, if you rely completely on uh, visualization of thrombus. But of course, if you add the incompressibility, then that, that increases the sensitivity quite a bit. And the Doppler criteria remain very, very important. But the lessons we learned from this early experience was that you really need to, to rely on multiple criteria and use both imaging and Doppler to get the best uh, accuracy. 
Uh, scanning of the calf veins, is, I think, is very important. Uh, there are different uh, opinions about this, which uh, maybe we'll get into a little bit later in some of the discussions. We differentiate between the axial calf veins and the muscular calf veins. Uh, they are relatively easy to image in most individuals now with, with, the, uh, with the nice new uh, uh, linear array scan heads. And here are some examples of uh, longitudinal and transverse images of, of normal uh, tibial and perineal veins at the top. And at the bottom there, there's uh, some uh, thrombosed uh, gastrocnemius veins. And another, uh, another example of uh, posterior tibial DVT, in this case, uh, it has the features of an acute DVT with enlarged veins. And uh, the ACCP guidelines over the years have gone back and forth on, on treatment or non-treatment or follow-up of uh, calf veins, but uh, I think it's still important in the IAC vascular standards to include scanning of calf veins as well. One of the uh, issues that comes up often is whether the thrombus that is present is acute or chronic. Uh, we don't claim to be able to determine the age of, of venous thrombus very accurately, uh, but there are some features that are more consistent with acute versus chronic, and they're listed here if the thrombus is homogeneous and smooth or hypoechoic or, or perhaps uh, very um, anechoic. Those are all acute features, and on the opposite end of the spectrum, if the, if the thrombus is very echogenic or irregular, uh, it's, those are more chronic features. Uh, if the vein's dilated, that's acute. If it's contracted, that's more chronic. If there's a free-floating or, or partially uh, free-floating tail, that's more acute. If collaterals are present, that's more chronic, and uh, so on. And. Uh, there have been a number of studies over the years, of course, on the accuracy of venous duplex for diagnosis of DVT. This is a, 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 a summary of eight systematic reviews, and it, there's a lot of numbers on this slide, so I, I, I won't make you read it, but basically this is a summary. So if we look at proximal lower extremity DVT, that is from the, from the popliteal up, sensitivities uh, range from 89% to 96%, and specificities from 94 to 99%, uh, although some studies report lower sensitivities in asymptomatic patients. Uh, there's not as much published uh, data on calf DVT, but uh, uh, sensitivities and specificities in, the, in the, certainly above 90 percent, although again, the, uh, the accuracy does vary in between symptomatic and asymptomatic patients as well. So I just want to uh, make some comments about the valuation of a chronic venous insufficiency. In, in the case of chronic venous insufficiency, we're not just interested in obstruction, as we are for DVT, but we're interested in reflux. And so the method used to elicit reflux is very important. And one of the things we learned early on in the Strandis lab when we, when we were, were studying venous physiology is that it takes a certain minimum reverse flow velocity to induce normal valve closure in a vein. And that velocity is about 30 centimeters per second. Now, if you use a valve salva to try to elicit reflux, you may be able to uh, generate 30 centimeters per second of reverse flow with a very cooperative patient, but this is not reliably generated by manual limb compression, particularly in big limbs and, and in sonographers or examiners with small hands. So manual limb compression really is not a very good way to, to elicit reflux. The other thing about reflux is that it doesn't occur when a patient's lying down or when they have their feet up. It only occurs when patients are standing uh, physiologically. So it makes sense to study the patient in the standing or an upright position. and. Uh, we figured out that release of distal cuff calf compression uh, is a good way of st uh, simulating muscular contraction relaxation, in other words, simulating the action of the calf muscular venous pump and to generate physiologic transvalvular pressure gradients. So this localizes the abnormal venous segments and in a, it's physiologic standardized and reproducible. So this is done, as I mentioned earlier, with an automatic cuff deflator. And the cuffs are positioned in the segment that's being examined, and the scanning is done just proximal to the cuff. And depending on where the cuff is located, uh, the cuff is inflated to a certain uh, pressure, which uh, just is meant to compress the veins. It's not meant to compress the arteries. So the pressure uh, is higher at the foot and the calf than it is in the thigh, and this is just related to hydrostatic pressure. The other important thing is that the, once the cuff is inflated, it has to be deflated very rapidly within uh, a fraction of a second, about a third of a second. 
And this can't be accomplished with standard blood pressure cuffs and standard blood pressure tubing. And you'll notice in this example that the tubing is actually about an inch in diameter. And that's because the, the smaller tubing has a higher resistance, even just to air, to getting the, uh, the, uh, the pressure out of the cuff rapidly. And it helps to have a little uh, stand like this so that the sonographer can, uh, doesn't have to sort of bend down quite as far. This is an example of the femoral uh, popliteal and, and uh, tibial with a foot cuff. And uh, normal duration of a reverse flow is usually less than one half of a second. That's what we use in our laboratory. Uh, the table shows some data from, I think it's uh, Nikos Labropoulos lab that uh, has differentiated between the great saphenous vein, small saphenous vein, and tibial veins, which um, uh, the threshold for reflux is, is half a second, and then the common femoral, femoral, and popliteal veins where the threshold is, is one second or 1,000 milliseconds. And the perforators are a little different. Uh, some labs use 350 milliseconds, some use half a second. Uh, we'll talk about the perforators tomorrow. But as I said, just to keep things simple in our lab, we use half a second for all, all the sites. And uh, this is what the, uh, what the waveforms look like with standing reflux. The, uh, the big spike that you see, uh, the first spike, uh, is valve, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, cuff inflation. So that's almost an augmentation that you see, or it is an augmentation. And then when, when the, f uh, the cuff is, is released, uh, normally you'll see just a little blip, like in the three uh, images on the left, and that's normal valve closure. If there's reflux flow, you'll see a, a whoosh or a prolonged reverse flow phase as shown with the double arrows on the, on the right. So it's, it's usually pretty easy to make this distinction. And of course, if the, if the reflux is in the range of 500 to 1,000 milliseconds, then of course that's, that's borderline and you just have to, have to uh, take that into account. So in summary, duplex is the diagnostic method of choice for acute lower extremity DVT, that is if you're looking for obstruction. We can also study uh, uh, reflux or detect reflux in different venous segments for uh, assessment of chronic venous insufficiency. Uh, multiple criteria are used uh, based on B-mode imaging and uh, physiologic flow parameters. Uh, the test is sensitive and specific for acute DVT, both in the proximal uh, lower extremity veins and the calf veins. And reflux should be assessed in the standing position, preferably by rapid cuff deflation. So, that's my introduction to Venus Ultrasound, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very, very uh, comprehensive. And to follow that, I will welcome Dr. John Golan to the podium, who's going to talk about what, the, what you do when the clinical findings in the ultrasound don't match. Dr. Golan is a vascular surgeon in practice here in Chicago, and he's um, part of our meeting each year, so welcome, John. Nice to see you, Patty. Thank you. Uh, so my talk is going to be a little bit of a summary of, of the previous two talks, as it turns out, uh, but it served as an honor to speak here, and particularly with giants of vascular surgery like Dr. Rook and Dr. Zerler, uh, it's quite an honor. So the question is, what do you do when you do your ultrasound and it really just doesn't match with the clinical findings? That's my disclosure. Well, as Dr. Zerler pointed out, in the vascular lab, for years we've talked about sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value. What I'm going to talk about is the false positives and false negatives. In the old days, we used to compare vascular lab studies to angiography to look at how accurate a carotid ultrasound was. We would compare it to a carotid angiogram. Venous imaging, we would compare it to a venogram. We don't really have those studies to compare it to anymore, so you won't see a lot written about this anymore. But what about the false positives? Well, for the most part, if you see a patient with venous reflux, you're going to treat them, so you really won't know that it's a false positive, so you won't see very many of these. What I would point out, though, is that asymptomatic saphenous vein reflux generally does not require treatment. Just because a patient is refluxing, if they have no symptoms, if they have no varicosities, if they have no stasis changes, you can leave those patients alone. Well, what would be some of the causes of false negatives? Well, if you're not doing the exams in your own office and sending them to a hospital-based lab, you can have reporting issues. You can have an incorrect leg studied, you could have the incorrect patient report, or you could have an incorrect interpretation. Uh, and then as Dr. Zerler pointed out, you can have technical issues. It's really important when you're looking for reflux that the patient is standing. 
you may identify reflux in a patient in the supine position, but the real uh, acid test is do they reflux standing. Frequently, we'll have patients do valsalva maneuvers to try to determine the presence of reflux, but many patients don't do a valsalva maneuver very well. They'll take a deep breath and they'll exhale without really bearing down, causing reflux. And then again, as was pointed out, typically in many labs, including ours, we still use a manual compression with the hand to uh, elicit reflux. And if you have a big leg, a small hand, uh, or a variety of other circumstances, it can be hard to uh, actually determine reflux if the situation isn't ideal. And lastly, you have to know how to use the Doppler. Ideally, you should have an angle of incidence of the Doppler of about 60 degrees to the flow to be sure you have the optimal chance for picking up reflux. However, if your Doppler exam was done properly and you can't find reflux, then you need to look elsewhere. Generally, most people are going to look at the great saphenous vein, they're going to look at the small saphenous vein, uh, but they forget about the veins of non-saphenous origin, which in about 10% of people are the veins that are causing uh, their varicosities or their leg pain. And these would include gluteal and pudendal veins coming from refluxing ovarian or internal iliac veins. These would include a variety of perforators in the thighs and the calves. And these would include a perforator or a vein that tends to arise from the popteal vein lateral to the origin of the small saphenous vein. You'll see a normal appearing small saphenous vein and lateral to it you'll see a large refluxing uh, popliteal tributary. If you do elect to treat that, I would just point out that typically that vein is very close to the perineal nerve and you need to be very careful that you don't wind up injuring the perineal nerve and causing the patient to have a foot drop. This is an example of a patient who you might look at and say that that's a posterior accessory branch of the great saphenous vein when in fact, um, is there a point here, Pat? Uh, when in fact, uh, right over here, there, you could feel a defect in the patient's fascia and there was a perforator. And on ultrasound exam, again, you can see the varicosities up here and this perforator coming out of the posterior thigh musculature feeding that vein. If your tech wasn't looking for it, she's not going to see it. She's just going to tell you the patient has some varicosities. And again, here's an example of some gluteal varicosities in a pregnant woman coming from her uh, internal iliac veins. Most commonly when you see these patients, uh, their varicosities uh, look like this. This woman's already delivered, and in fact, her internal iliac veins are now patent, but she has varicosities coming out of the inner aspect of the inguinal ligament. She has a perfectly normal great saphenous vein and small saphenous vein, and treatment of this uh, is going to require just sclerotherapy or local phlebectomy. And again, you have to look at the posterior accessory saphenous vein, or the so-called intersaphenous vein. Uh, this is a vein that connects the great saphenous vein with the small saphenous vein. Sometimes it goes by the name of the vein of Giacomini. Occasionally, the small saphenous vein has an extension in the thigh that joins the femoral vein posteriorly here. But again, this has to be part of your venous ultrasound exam, uh, particularly if you're not seeing reflux in areas that you think you should be seeing it. Well, what do you do if you have a conflicting study? Well, we're going to talk in a second a little bit about the history and physical, but I always find that being present at the time of the ultrasound exam is very helpful. Again, if it's just a classic, straightforward case of great or small saphenous reflux, your tech is going to be able to tell you that very easily. But if it's something that's unusual or a little different pattern of varicosities, I will talk with my tech beforehand or I'll actually be in the room. If that doesn't work, you can always do the exam yourself. I think that most of you who are treating venous disease should become very facile with doing a venous ultrasound exam. And while it's not economically feasible for me to do all the exams, uh, clearly when there's a patient in whom we're just really uh, confused about, I will do the exam myself. Well, what about the truly negative exam? You've studied everything and you can't find reflux, but the patient continues to have leg complaints. And uh, this is basically, I'm going to repeat what Dr. Rooks talked about. I mean, there are alternative causes of leg pain. And so it's useful to take a history do a physical exam. Several times a year I will see patients for second opinions uh, from a variety of vein clinics who have a variety of laser procedures proposed and you talk to them and they're actually claudicating. Uh, arthritis is very common in these people, fibromyalgia, Baker cyst, the list you know is probably 50 or 60 things long. 
but you have to talk to the patient and find out what really is causing their leg pain. As far as edema goes, you can have unilateral leg edema and bilateral leg edema. In my opinion, the minority of patients with edema have edema related to saphenous vein reflux. Most commonly in unilateral leg edema, lymphedema precox or tartar, which is typically seen in women in the 30s through 50s, uh, and is a kind of a congenital atresia of the lymphatic system is a common cause. You can have Baker's cysts, you can have residual lymphedema following cellulitis, you can have a post lobitic syndrome, you can have May-Thurner syndrome. I think we'll see examples of that later, but this is just a typical patient with narrowing of the left common iliac vein that's been treated with a stent. Bilateral leg edema, rarely will bilateral leg edema be caused by bilateral saphenous vein reflux. Uh, again, the things you have to think about are more systemic causes, cirrhosis, obesity, heart failure. A common cause that I see these days is increased salt intake. The American diet is full of salt, and you'll see patients that will come in who just eat more salt than you can believe, and you just get them to reduce their salt intake, and their leg edema goes away. You know, the one thing you don't want to do is wind up treating a patient uh, without good indications and having them come back uh, and torment you for the rest of your practice because you treated them and they still have a problem and why won't you make me better? So at the end of the day, uh, my recommendation is remember that when you're treating patients, you're a doctor who's treating venous conditions. You're not a vein doctor. Uh, so you, while you may see a lot of patients with varicose veins or with leg symptoms, remember there's lots of causes to them and they're not all venous. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Golan. So Dr. Rook uh, will come back to the podium now and talk to us about chronic venous insufficiency, uh, stockings or intervention, or perhaps Lovenox or intervention. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Yes, well, let's see. This is about perspectives here. And uh, again, no conflicts, except I, I do want to point out to you that, you know, how patients look at things uh, may be different from the way we look at things. And sometimes you got to get the whole picture together to be able to, to get uh, the real perspective here. Well, from a patient's perspective, what are the real issues regarding varicose, uh, regarding venous disease? Patty gave me 12 minutes, so in keeping with the themes that we're hearing today, I think I'm going to limit this discussion to varicose veins. Uh, 12 minutes, that kind of gives me enough time to maybe look at three questions and answers here. And no, I, these are, the, these are the, the three that I'm going to look at. I guess I have a, little bit, a couple extra minutes, so I'll talk slower here. These are the three things that we're um, going to deal with today from a, that patients think about. The first, how can I prevent varicose veins is really something that uh, is very important to most patients from their perspective. The other two, do I have to wear stockings and you know, how do we treat them? Those are, are questions that individual patients often have very uh, distinct perspectives on. Well, let's deal with the first question here. How can I prevent varicose veins? Uh, you know, there's really two questions that we're asking here. The first is, can we prevent varicose veins? And, you know, everybody from childhood on, we learn about Smokey Bear, preventing forest fires, prevention of problems is drilled into our heads early on. So it's not surprising that patients think about this. But if we can't prevent varicose veins, can we at least prevent the complications due to venous disease? And patients, from their perspective, will often tell you that this is the most important reason why they're coming to you. They're here because I want to take care of something now before it becomes severe. One of the first things I always have to straighten patients out on is that while that's a, a noble cause, uh, the insurance world absolutely could not care less about preventing venous problems down the road. They don't have to prevent problems because, you know, when you turn 65, you're somebody else's problem. So, why spend a lot of money preventing things up front? And uh, this idea that, you know, it's fine to just wait till things get bad and then fix them. Gosh, that's what we do for joint replacements and for cataracts. Why don't we just do the same for varicose veins? So whether you believe in that approach or not, often 
I spend time straightening out the patient's perspective on this. Now, can we prevent varicose veins? Patients are convinced that we can, and they, will, they are always coming to you and asking you, what can I do in terms of lifestyle? How do I exercise different, or what can I, I change that'll make me not get veins? Or nutrition, they're all convinced that, you know, if we just, Doc, if you just told me what to eat, I've read on the internet that, you know, I'd be able to avoid varicose veins. Or that we're holding out on them with some of these key medications here that uh, we could give them that would take care of this problem. And again, there's this, this perspective issue that early treatment will we'll keep them from getting more varicose veins later on. And I have to tell people constantly that, you know, at least as far as I understand this problem, none of these are really the answer here. Varicose veins are genetic. Uh, it's like when a guy starts to lose his hair or when we start to get wrinkles. And I don't know how we can turn these things off. So maybe the bigger question then is can we prevent the complications? This is what patients are often asking me about. And I tell them there, well, yeah, we do have some options for preventing complications. I could have you elevate your legs all day. Of course, the problem there is that you're a perpetual couch potato. That's not really a very uh, reasonable solution. So we tell them that we could potentially prevent the complications by eliminating their varicose vein component of, uh, of any reflux they have, and boy, that's what they all want to hear. They want to hear, yes, let's get these veins taken out. But you know, when it comes to preventing complications, the third option is to simply compress them with elastic compression, and that's the option that they never want to hear about. So let me segue that into question number two here, because from the patient's perspective, one of the hugest issues I deal with is, Doc, do I really have to wear compression stockings? Patients don't like them. Now remember, compression stockings developed, you know, their, their big popularity in the 1950s. Remember what vein operations were like then? Everybody has a grandmother who says, oh, I was in the hospital for two weeks and I was off work for three months. It was the worst operation in the world. Vein surgery was pretty traumatic in the 50s and 60s. In contrast, when you're dressing like this, wearing compression stockings wasn't a big deal. So compression stockings went through a period where they were much more popular than, uh, than surgery or, or uh, direct repair. Nowadays though, both fashions and the way we live have changed completely and patients don't like these things. They become hard to apply as you get older or as you develop joint disease. They're invariably hot and tight and have elements about them that are uncomfortable, and nobody likes the cosmetic appearance. So this becomes, uh, from a patient's perspective, a huge issue here. Uh, and often they'll, uh, you know, make it akin to the idea that, uh, you know, gee, doc, if I came in with a hernia, you wouldn't tell me to wear a truss forever. You'd just fix the thing surgically. Um, why are you telling me to just, you know, compress with these stockings here? Well. The reasons are out, outlined and, and sort of logical to think about why people might want to do it. Do stockings prevent varicose veins? Well, I already told you the answer to that. I don't know of anything that will actually prevent them, but, you know, I have some cover for this. If you were to look, for example, at the recommendations of the National Health Service in Great Britain, they'll point out that, uh, you know, they're, they're being kind about this. They say that nobody knows if stockings will help prevent your varicose veins. I think I know, I haven't you know, been impressed that they prevent things. But can they prevent the complications of varicose veins and, and venous insufficiency? And there we have good reliable sources like the Cochrane database who will tell us that yeah, compression hosiery reduces the rate of venous reulceration. I think we can, we can show that pretty good. But notice the line that follows here. However, rates of patient intolerance a compression hosiery are high. Again, patients from their perspective don't like to wear this stuff even if it works for preventing the complications. So from a patient's perspective, I always look at this as sort of being a balancing act. On the one hand, you know, wearing stockings might make your symptoms better and they may prevent long-term problems. On the other hand, they're ugly, they're hot, they're tight, and patients generally hate them. 
So you've got to find some way of, of getting your patient to balance these two in a way that they're able to accept. You know, when I was a kid, I used to have to deal with these same kind of balancing acts. I used to love to kiss girls. Oh, it was great. Uh, but my father told me that I would go blind if I did it too much. So, of course, Patty, the answer is I, I just did it till I needed glasses. You know, it's a question of just balancing things just right. Anyway, this is probably my favorite varicose vein slide and study in the entire world. It's been, it's been published, but I, I bring it out almost every chance I get from Lurie and Kistner, uh, 2011 study here. They, just to illustrate how, how people feel about stockings in real life, they took 150 patients with varicose veins that uh, range from being relatively asymptomatic to having pain or edema with them, and they made all 150 wear graduated compression stockings for three to six months. And what happened to those patients? 75% of them, 74%, their symptoms improved with stockings, and 26% they didn't improve. Well, in today's modern world, these patients would be deemed failures and could go on to have their veins fixed, and these vein patients would be told by their insurance companies, hey, stockings work, so why don't you just stick with that? Now, what was great about this study is that at the conclusion of it, they then told patients, now that you've completed the study, we'll do for you whatever you want to have done. What would you prefer to have done? What they found was that 80% of patients, including the ones who improved with stockings, discontinued at that point and opted to have surgery. And this was the big kicker. If you improved, if your symptoms improved when you wore stockings, you had a 21 per times higher chance of improving with surgery or intervention. So here's the way we conventionally approach things right now, in the, at least in the insurance world here. Um, if you have varicose veins, um, we put you in stockings, and if you don't improve, you get surgery. If you improve, they tell you to continue your stockings. A more logical approach might be, based on that study I showed you, that if you improve, you go to surgery, because you're likely to improve with that, too. The problem is, is that if you don't improve, what do you do? Well, that then lends us, or leads us, I should say, to probably the best option at all, which has basically been endorsed by all the societies that endorse these things, and that is just offer an intervention to everybody who comes, comes in with symptomatic veins, and if they improve, you're finished. And if they don't improve, well, at least you've got stockings to fall back on in that situation. So, that's where we stand on that. Now, part of the balancing, again, has to do with the treatment options. You know, Patients, when it comes time to go to some sort of interventional procedure, they, they all have their own perspective on, on what's important to them. People want things to be painless, and they want them to be inexpensive, the treatments, and they want the treatments to be safe, and they want to make sure there's no downtime from the procedure or limited disability afterwards, and they don't like scars, and they don't want to have to travel uh, a lot to get this done. They want it done quickly. And they all, of course, want perfect results, right? Except, from a patient's perspective, not every patient values each of these endpoints equally. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Bush, I see him back there, you would agree with me on this, because I'm sure you do your share of fashion models. Of those things that I listed there, you know, some people, the fashion model stereotype, for example, are concerned about having perfect results and no scars. They care a lot less about whether there's downtime or what the procedure is going to cost. Now, I'd ask you to contrast that to the perspective from, say, a busy mom whose real important features for her are that there's no downtime, she gets a quick recovery, and that whatever she gets done is done fast and she doesn't have to travel a lot. It amazes me how, how far down the totem pole they often put things like safety and whether or not the treatments are going to hurt. And then, of course, you got the third major category of, of uh, patients you got to deal with men. Men want it to be painless, whatever you do to them, cheap and painless, safe and painless. They want to make sure they can still drink beer while you're treating them. And then, of course, you know, scars, eh, who cares? Scars are good. So, you know, totally different priority list. So here's where I'm going to leave you. 
on this. I've asked you to think about three key questions from a patient's perspective. Patients want to know, how could I prevent varicose veins? And we tell them you can't. Uh, and even if you could, nobody's going to pay for it. So be prepared to pay for it out of pocket. And they find that shocking from their perspective. Do they really have to wear stockings? Well, I have to tell them they're not going to prevent new varicose veins from, from appearing. They might prevent the signs of, the, uh, of venous disease or your symptoms uh, from bothering you or from progressing. And finally, with regard to the treatments that we can offer them, they need to understand that no given treatment is exactly right for everybody, and that's where I have to dig in to find out what their perspective of treatment is, uh, and that, of course, you know, no pain and no gain for the, for the men there. And that's where I'm going to leave this. Thank you very much. That was great. I enjoyed it. You can stay up here if you want, uh, if you don't want to. Uh, our next, no, our next talk is from Dr. Mahmoud Razavi, who is an interventional radiologist, very well known in the country for his work uh, with imaging and uh, interventional radiology procedures, both arterial and venous. He comes from St. Joseph Hospital in Orange County, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Patty, for having me. Uh, so the talk is uh, really on the imaging uh, uh, CTMR uh, of, uh, uh, for venous disease. Um, the, uh, uh, it's not advancing. OK, there we go. These are the disclosures. The main disclosure is none of these related to what we're talking about today. The main disclosure is that I'm not a diagnostic radiologist. So uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I won't be able to tell you a whole lot about uh, how to uh, do good CTs and MRs. Uh, but I can review the literature for you and tell you how I use these cross-sectional imaging in, in our patients. So uh, as far as diagnostic workup for DVT, you've heard a couple of great talks earlier today. Really, the symptoms provoke the diagnostic evaluation for these patients. And the most common ones are edema and leg discomfort. As you can see, the main thing is in outpatients, there's a, a sizable number of patients who are asymptomatic. In this study by Goldhaber, it was 11% 11, 11 of those patients were actually asymptomatic, which is interesting. Now, the workup of DVT, obviously, you want to confirm the diagnosis, and ultrasound is the uh, standard of care for these patients. And then you institute therapy, whatever therapy is appropriate, and then you search for causes of DVT, which determine uh, the prognosis and continuation of therapy in those patients. Uh, ultrasound with diagnosis of DVT, these studies are not uh, new, but very high sensitivity and specificity and diagnostic value. A uh, little bit less in asymptomatic patients, and therefore ultrasound is the, the, the uh, me methodology or imaging of choice for these patients. I don't know which direction I should be holding this thing uh, to go to the next image. So what is the role of CT venography? Well, let's talk about that in a second. Remember that uh, in, in terms of CT imaging of all parts of the body, including cancer, which CT is the oldest, I mean, people have been doing it for a long time, is in evolution. Uh, we now have 25, six, uh, two, 256 slice scanners that they do full coverage of the body in one to two seconds. Uh, advantages, evaluation of pulmonary arteries, uh, pelvic veins, and vena cava, which you don't have the opportunity to do, basically of central veins. Uh, with ultrasound, and disadvantages include uh, the uh, exposure to radiation, uh, contrast dose, and equipment and expertise are not widely available. Despite what, what your radiologist may tell you, if they don't have an interest in, in cross-sectional vascular imaging, you're not going to get diagnostic images using either CT or MRI. Um, and here's, a, for example, an exam, uh, a CT uh, 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 venogram uh, arteriogram and venogram from, from our site, which are re we're reasonable at it. And all you can tell here that the patient has a left lower extremity edema. That's all you can tell. And ultrasound showed that, in fact, there was horrendous uh, DVT uh, iliofemoral extending all the way into the iliac veins. So it really, the diagnostic guys have to be interested in this and do dedicated work to be able to get good diagnostic imaging. So when they are, what, are we, what can we expect? Um, 
so you have a sense, the evaluation of uh, diagnostic accuracy of C, uh, CT venography in, in proximal DVT, as you can see, when ultrasound used as a gold standard, sensitivity 100%, specificity of 96%, and you can see the positive and negative predictive values there with a median uh, cumulative dose of 8.26 millisieverts. So what does that mean? I, I have no idea. Um, now, indirect CTV. What does indirect CTV mean? That means the patients that are suspected to have pulmonary artery, uh, pulmonary uh, embolism, when they do CT uh, angiogram, CT pulmonary angiogram, which is now the diagnostic methodology of choice for pulmonary embolism, they can at the same time with the same contrast imaging go and look at the legs and the pelvis. What is the value of that? Um, the question is, could the diagnosis of DVT be established at the same time and eliminating the need for an additional ultrasound in those patients? Because when they come into the emergency room with pulmonary uh, uh, suspicion of pulmonary, uh, pulmonary embolism, the CT is done for that looking at the legs first. Uh, and, and if so, does the diagnosis of DVT change the treatment? <coughs> Let's look at the studies. And here's a study that looked at uh, uh, the 642 patients. Uh, 227 were positive for PE, 35%. Only 0.7% were positive for uh, DVT when the CT uh, was positive for PE, which is very small. And CT venogram was negative for DVT in all patients who had pulmonary, who did not have pulmonary embolism. So you could argue that if you do the pulmonary angiogram or pulmonary CT angiogram and it's negative, you should stop right there. There's, uh, there's no point in going and looking at the legs. The additional radiation dose, as you can see, was between 4.8 to 9.7 millisieverts. Another study, uh, retrospective, looking at uh, over 800 patients. And what they did was interesting. They broke their patients into high risk and low risk for DVT. And the high risk included patients who had malignancy, cardiovascular disease, were post-surgical or had higher uh, uh, venous thromboembolic disease. Pulmonary embolism was diagnosed in 15%, NEVT in about 8, 18%, DVT in about 7%, and isolated DVT in only 3.4%. When you break it down into high risk and low risk group, you can see that the high risk group, the value, the diagnostic value of both this uh, uh, pulmonary angiogram, a CT pulmonary angiogram, and indirect CTV is much higher. However, if you look at the last line, isolated DVT, the diagnosis was only in 1.6% of the patients, even uh, in the low risk patients, and about 5% in the high risk patients. So the question is, is it really of any value? Now, meta-analysis of 17,000 patients, they, uh, they the conclusion was that CT venography increased the detection of VTE by identifying an additional 3% isolated DVT. That's pretty low. However, their conclusion was that it does increase the detection of CT, uh, uh, DVT. But in my opinion, 3% additional for the cost that is involved is pretty low. So does the diagnosis of DVT make a difference in these patients? So this is indirect CT venography. Well, if you have, if the CTA is positive for PE and the patient has pole pulmonary reserve and contraindications to the anticoagulation, yes it does, because you can put an IBC filter in those patients. Because if they don't have clot, obviously you don't put a filter in those patients. If CTA is negative for pulmonary, uh, and, uh, for pulmonary embolism, CT venography does not add much value. The incremental value is between 0% to 3.4%, which is not much. And the diagnostic and ultrasound is the diagnostic modality of choice if DVT is suspected in those patients. Now, optimal use of uh, indirect CTV, if you have a high suspicion of pulmonary embolism and presence of risk factors for venous thromboembolic disease, presence of uh, uh, in, uh, or indications uh, for IBC filter, obviously, if you're considering IBC filter or evaluation of central veins. Now, we do these cross-sectional imaging only to look at central veins for no other reasons. And here's a patient from our center, who a 22-year-old presented with acute first episode of DVT in the right lower extremity. And you can see CT venography showed absence of KWAL. Now, this patient actually had a uh, probably KWAL thrombosis at birth. Current state-of-the-art diagnostic accuracy of CTV is well established. Most current work, however, is concentrated in areas to increase the, uh, the detection rate and utility 
uh, of these uh, of these uh, studies. And, and actually, there's some interesting stuff going on in there, which is outside the uh, scope of our talk. MR venography, same thing. Advantages, evaluation of pelvic veins, collateral circulation, cave up, pulmonary arteries, things of, just like CT. Uh, but it's costly, this advan uh, and, and it takes a long time, and expertise is not available everywhere. When it is available, then do it. It's very highly, uh, uh, the sensitivity and specificity are very high, and diagnostic value is also very high in those patients. Potential applications of MR, pelvic and intrathoracic venous structures, like may Turner syndrome, pelvic congestion syndrome, pelvic DVT, determination of approximate age of clot. This is a great research tool. There are a couple of studies ongoing on this. Uh, we'll wait and see what happens to those. Really not indicated, not indicated with routine diagnosis of DVT. What, where I like MR is the time resolve sequences, where you actually look at the flow. You can look at the flow between different channels, the superficial versus deep, versus varicose veins in the pelvis. You can look at the collateral. It is just like a venogram uh, that in, you're injecting contrast. So time resolve sequences are really nice if your diagnostic guys know how to do them well. Here's an example, as you can see, left axillo uh, subclavian acute DVT. Uh, the the intrathoracic portion of this, obviously, you cannot uh, see with ultrasound. Um, here's a, a, a CT angiogram with the venous phase, and you can see a very nice uh, May Turner syndrome. Interestingly enough, you can see reflux in the uh, ovarian vein on the left side, which is hard to do with ultrasound. Uh, CT venography in the same pa in a different kind of patient. You can see the pelvic varices very nicely. You can see the anatomy very nicely. So the central veins where you cannot see with ultrasound well, CT and uh, MR do very good job. Other than that, really, there's not much uh, uh, to that. Now, potential indications for CT and MR venography. CTV in the setting of suspected PV uh, p uh, permeambulism, as we talked about, in combination with indirect CTV. Uh, CT or MR to rule out pelvic venous pathologies or clot, if you're going to do something about it. If not, there is no point in knowing uh, what that is. And there's really not indicated for routine diagnosis. Now, in conclusion, both CT and MR venography are highly accurate in diagnosis. So there's no question about their accuracy. However, ultrasound is the standard of care uh, for the routine uh, uh, diagnosis of DVT. Uh, and preferred to ultrasound, those cross-sectional imaging uh, in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, looking at the superior vena cava, IBC, mesenteric veins, which really uh, ultrasound most of the time cannot tell, pelvis, and potentially renals if ultrasound cannot tell. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, we're going to take a break now. I, I, the question and answer series will come at the end of the next session, so save your questions for everyone. I forgot that uh, we're not doing that right now. But uh, we will have a break for 20 minutes and come back right at 10.30. Around 10.30, we'll start with a uh, live case that was taped. Uh, so we'll, we'll be doing that for the next session. Thank you.